Well, I really appreciate the invitation to be here. I was uh, praying the other morning, and since I retired from my, my third church about a year and a half ago, I've been complaining to God. Has anybody ever done that? Yeah. <laughs> yes. I said, Lord, I said, why aren't I getting more opportunities to share and teach? And, well, why haven't you established a small group ministry, Lord, that I can help with and work with and be in? And, and so I'm praying the other morning, and uh, I, I you know, asked him for special opportunities. And, and uh, I said, no, no, Lord, I'm just going to be quiet. I said, you, you share with me, Lord, what, what, uh, what you want. And I heard a pretty clear word. He said, uh, Tom, there's only one God, and you're not him. <laughs> I am. And so I got the message to leave it in his hands. Amen? Amen. You just have to leave it in his hands. And so he is indeed, I am, and I, I want to be under his leadership to fulfill his plan. What would you say was the main purpose of the church for his cold at ones, for his children, for his ecclesia, for, for us in this? What do you believe his main purpose for us is? Anybody have an idea? Draw closer to him. What's that? Draw closer to him. To draw closer to him, yeah. He was well. Relationship. Is that all? What he spoke to me was that after his resurrection, God gave the foundation for all of their future ministry for the church. He tells every believer the same thing today that he told his believers then. Each one of us has the same mandate from Jesus who said, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not conquer it. And he has chosen to build his church using us. We are his plan A and plan B and we are his only plan, right? To build his church with him. And here's what he said in Matthew Mark 16 and verse 15. He said, go into all the world and do what? Preach the gospel. Preach the good news to everyone. Anyone who believes and is baptized will be saved. But anyone who refuses to believe will be condemned. And then in Mark, Matthew 28, and verse 18, Jesus came and told his disciples, I have been given all authority in heaven and on earth. Therefore, what? Go, go, and, make go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. In part two, teach these new disciples to obey all the commands that I have given you and be sure of this, said Jesus, I am with you. I am with you always, even to the end of the age. And then in John 8, Jesus said to the people who believed in him, you are truly my disciples if you remain faithful to my teaching. And you will know the truth. And the truth will set you free. Amen. And you will know Jesus. And Jesus will set you free. And you will know the Word. And the Word will set you free. Amen. Amen. Jesus is the truth. The Word is the truth. And that is what we are promised that we will know if we remain faithful to His teaching. So there's a three-part message here to us as the church. Number one, preach the gospel to everyone so many will believe. And we preach the gospel sometimes not using words, just by being us and by being Christ-like. And the second thing he says is make disciples of these new believers. As soon as you have a new believer, make a disciple. Don't just cut them loose and say, good luck. We're to make disciples, teaching them everything that Jesus taught. And the third thing he says, we need to encourage them, as they grow as disciples, to encourage them to remain faithful to his teachings. Uh, another translation says, abide in my word. He says, 
Teach them to abide in my word, to live there, to be connected, to, to have them, my life flowing through them. So I believe there's two distinct groups of people in the church. First, there are those who have received Christ as Savior, and uh, that's as far as they go. They're believers. You see a change in their life. They get involved in ministry. They uh, do what they can in the church. These are believers. And the second group are believers who are pursuing a higher calling, pursuing a higher devotion in the kingdom of God to become what I believe Jesus meant when he said, truly become my disciples, to become true disciples, not just believers, but true disciples. So I believe we have, we have in the church, we've got believers who are content to just stay there and wait till Jesus comes. And then there are those who are true disciples who really want to grow and mature and become effective in the kingdom of God during their, in, their, in their daily lives. So as I said, believers have got a true life change. You see a life change in them. Uh, there's righteousness and there's some purity in their lives. And they get involved in ministry and they're faithful to church attendance. But they often fall short of being true disciples. God's highest desire for you and for me is for us to become true disciples. I believe that with all my heart. Amen. The focus of a true disciple is very different from that of a nominal believer. Here's how Jesus described Now, Jesus was a... a <laughs> Jesus had a, had a knack of thinning out the crowd. <laughs> they came as a big crowd to see the miracles and see the and hear the wonderful teaching that he did and the, and to and to get a free lunch and do all this stuff. They they came in crowd, but, but Jesus wasn't after a crowd. Do you realize that? He wasn't after building a big crowd. He was good at thinning them out. Yep. And when they came, here's what he told them one time in Luke chapter 14. A large crowd was following Jesus. And he turned around and said to them, If you want to be my disciple, you must, by comparison, remember he said that, you must, by comparison, hate everyone else. You think his crowd kind of gasped? Hmm. Like, <clears throat> you must, by comparison, hate everyone else. Your father, your mother, your wife, your children, your brothers, your sisters, yes, even your own life. Otherwise, you cannot be my disciple. And if you do not carry your own cross and follow me, you cannot be my disciple. In verse 33, he says, so you cannot become my disciple without giving up everything you own. I think you can imagine that many people stood up and said, I'm out of here. This is not for me. This is too much. But you know, the word hate is not what we think it is today. It simply meant that if your family, when you become a believer in Christ, and you begin to follow Jesus, if your family rejects you, and come against you because of your commitment. You must follow Christ, even though it means you're separated from your family. You must follow Him. If you lose your job, if your life is threatened, for a true disciple, there's no compromise with the world, with the flesh, and with the devil. To be real honest with you, I struggle with this. I've been in ministry some 35 years, and I've struggled with this. This is not easy for me. It's not easy for anybody. Because we have a world around us that tries to draw us into things that look fun, look entertaining, and, and look profitable, and, and, and look great. And God says, if you want to be a true disciple of Jesus, 
You've got to set all that aside and follow him. So a true disciple is a godly example to everyone around him. And he's, a, he's a godly example to his, to his or her spouse, his parent, the employee, as an employee, as a bold witness for Christ. They fulfill all of life's obligations, the stuff we have to do every day, clean the house, go to work, all this stuff that goes on every day. And yet the first priority is to serve Christ and other people, just as his was. A true disciple has a passion to know Christ, to know him, to accomplish his will every day. Just going about our normal routine, accomplishing His will every day. <laughs> but we have a problem. I have a problem. You have a problem. And it's the same problem Paul had. He had a powerful and miraculous ministry. He wrote most of the New Covenant, most of the New Testament Scriptures. But in one way, we're a lot like him. In Romans chapter 7, here's what he said. He says, I know that nothing good lives in me that is in my flesh. I want to do what is right, but I can't. I want to do what's good, but I don't. I don't want to do what's wrong, but I do it anyway. But if I do what I don't want to do, and this is really kind of hard to understand, that if I do what I don't want to do, I am not really the one doing wrong. It is sin living in me that does it. So what he's doing is he's separating who he is in Christ from who he is in his flesh. He says, who I am in Christ does not want my flesh to do what I do, or wants my flesh to do what I don't do. But it's not me, it's that sin that still lives in me. It's still in me. You know, I'm going to touch on that in a way I hope you've never heard before today. When we be, became Christians, when we believed Jesus, when we received Him and were born again, we became a child of God. We became a new creation. We, we were totally forgiven, past, present, future. We were cleansed of our sin. We were seated with Christ in heavenly places. And so much more. And yet, we can still struggle as Paul did. In Luke 14, verse 27, Jesus said, If you do not carry your own cross and follow me, you cannot be my disciple. And yet we have these struggles going on in our lives. So, if someone were to ask you, well, what does it mean to carry your own cross? What would you say? Anybody? What does it mean to carry your own cross? Suffer for Christ. Give up your life. No, yeah, suffer for Christ. Struggle for Christ, right. Die of self. Die to yourself, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Sometimes we have trouble explaining these things. And I struggled with it too, but it is really means them willing to be crucified with Christ for his sake. I'm willing to give up everything. I'm willing to let it all go in obedience to his word and to the Holy Spirit. That's my willingness. I've got this cross that I'm carrying, and I'm, it just means I'm willing to do anything. If you say so, Lord, I'm going to do it. If you say, let it all go, I'll let it all go. I'll do it for you, Lord. Some people say, well, I've got this trouble, that's just my cross to bear. No, 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 that's not what it means. <laughs> it means I'm willing to give up everything. Romans 6, verse 6. And we know that our old sinful selves were crucified with Christ so that sin might lose its power in our lives. We are no longer slaves to sin. So when we're born again, our old sinful selves are crucified with Christ. Galatians 2.20 My old self has been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. I have a new life. I have a new identity in Christ. So I live in this earthly body 
by trusting in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Galatians 2.24, those who belong to Christ Jesus have, have nailed the passions and desires of their sinful nature or their flesh, nailed the passions and desires of their flesh to his cross and crucified them. Well, so like Paul, though, we, we still do stuff we shouldn't do. We don't do things we should do. And then someone will say, but, but, but Tom, I thought... It had all been killed on the cross. It all been killed. And I say, no. No. A person nailed to a cross in those days, when they, that was the most horrible execution you could imagine. A person nailed in the cross in those days does not die right away. That person struggles and suffers Perhaps for days sometimes they will hang on that cross suffering. And so our old sinful nature, our flesh, our worldliness, our, our, our demonic tendencies is nailed to the cross, but it's still struggling. It's still alive. It still has a life. It's that sin living in us, as Paul said. It's in the process of dying. Process. It's a slow, difficult process. My, it's my sanctification, my maturing, and letting go of, of all those fleshly things, those worldly things that we, that we have in our lives is tough and painful. That, that doesn't want to die. That wants to come back and control us again. But every time we trust God, Every time we deny ourselves, the old self dies a little more, loses a little more of its vitality in our lives. So it's a walk, it's a journey, it's a, it's a moving ahead with Christ. And as I do that, I keep my focus on Him, the old self dies more, keeps dying, keeps dying. It, it's never going to die completely in my lifetime. But when I go to be in heaven, it'll be gone forever. Galatians 5. Let the Holy Spirit guide your lives. Then you won't be doing what your flesh craves. The flesh wants to do evil, which is just the opposite of what the Spirit wants. And the Spirit gives us desires that are the opposite of what the flesh desires. So he says these two forces are constantly fighting each other. Can you relate to this? <laughs> the flesh and the spirit, the flesh and the spirit, back and forth, back and forth. And that's, but sin, now listen to this, sin cannot make us his slave anymore. Sin cannot make us its slave. Because it's nailed to the cross. Because it's condemned. Because it's restrained by the spirit. Cannot make us its slave. If we have faith in God's power in our lives, we can look at sin and we can say, you have no power over me anymore. Because you've been nailed. You've been immobilized. You no longer can grab me and hold me because you're, you're on that cross. You're dead. You're not dead. You're dying. <laughs> So what Paul does, as we saw in Romans 7, he separates his flesh from his spirit identity. Flesh identity, spirit identity. And we must do the same. It says in 1 John 3, 9, this hard for us to... Whoever has been born of God does not sin. For his, that means God's, seed remains in him and he cannot sin because he's been born of God. Now, wait a minute. I already blew it this morning. No, your, your, net, your spiritual self did not sin. Your identity in Christ. So what God wants us to do is he wants us to confess our sin, not for forgiveness, not to be forgiven, but for our own benefit, 
agreeing with God. We agree with God that that behavior, those words I said, that attitude I had, was not Christ-like, not pleasing to you, Lord, and I need to change. Yep. Yes. We're forgiven, but we have to repent. We've got to change. We've got we to move in God's direction and away from our own direction. We need to recognize our failures. God, that's what God wants us to do. Recognize our failures. Recognize them and say, yeah, you're right. I, I'm wrong, Lord. You're right. How many of you know somebody who's never told you that they were wrong? <laughs> we need to say, God, I was wrong. I was wrong. And I need to change. But Lord, I can't change. I haven't got the strength to change, but you can change me. And I need your help, Lord. Change my direction. Holy Spirit, change me. And that's the heart of a true disciple. So here's the fact. Our spiritual identity in Christ cannot sin. Spiritual identity in Christ cannot sin. We are no longer slaves to sin. It's lost our power. It lost its power in our lives to hold us. Romans 6, 6 says that sin loses its power. Galatians 2.20 tells us it loses its power by trusting in the Son of God. And this is the promise. All the crucified flesh can do. Now, here's that crucified flesh on the cross. And, and he, he can't get to us. He can't grab us and hold us. But he can lie to us. Yes. He can try to persuade us. He can try to convince us that, that we should do something different. He's always talking to us, isn't he? There's that, 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 there's that battle going on. The spirit of God against the, the, the spirit of the flesh. And so by faith, and only by faith, can we overcome the temptation to obey those lies, to believe those lies, only through the power of God's Holy Spirit in us. And 1 Corinthians 2 says, when I first came to you, dear brothers and sisters, I didn't use lofty words and impressive wisdom to tell you God's secret plan. Oh my gosh, there's a lot of that going on in the church today. <laughs> lofty words, impressive wisdom, God's secret plan. The Apostle Paul said, I'm not going to do that. I'm not. It isn't up to me to do that. He said, I decided that when I'm with you, when I come with you, I'd forget everything except Jesus Christ, the one who was crucified. I came to you in weakness, timid and trembling. You know what the, the real temptation is for someone like me and Eric? other ministers who stand in front of a group of people. They're going to make an impression. I, when I leave here, I want people to pat me on the back and say, wow, wasn't that great? That's the temptation. And Paul knew it well. But he was admired, he was revered, and wherever he went, they recognized him and, and and they came to see him. But he said, no, that's not, that's, I can't do that. That's, I mean, I'm sitting here this morning and singing some of those great songs. And I'm thinking there, who am I? Who am I to stand here and present the word of God? And he was the same way, Paul was the same way. Because he said, I came to you in weakness timid and trembling. <clears throat> timid and trembling. And that, that responsibility is powerful. Yeah. And it, it's humility is one of the hardest things we have to deal with, isn't it? Right. Thinking too highly of ourselves is what we like to do. The effectiveness of Christ's crucifixion continues today. It's an ongoing power to free believers from sin's ability to enslave us, from pride's ability to, to control our lives. 
Paul trembled because he recognized the weight of that responsibility. Yep. He said, no. And he, he said that I mean, often in the, in the Word. He said, who am I? He said, I'm just a man. I'm just... But I cannot but speak what God has told me to speak. As crucified disciples, we're able to communicate the Gospel with the same humble humility and effectiveness that Paul did. But we've got to be a crucified disciple. We have to recognize our inability in our own power, in our own strength to, to, to do anything for the kingdom of God. 1 Corinthians 2, he went on in that same vein. He said, my message and my preaching were very plain. Rather than using clever and persuasive speeches, I relied only on the power of the Holy Spirit. I did this so you would trust not in human wisdom, but in the power of God. Amen. And I, I, I say to you this morning, don't trust in my wisdom, the words that I say. Trust in the power of God. Go to the Word. We gotta, we gotta turn our backs and shut our ears to that struggling flesh and worldliness that's been nailed to the cross. And we do it in one thing, in the freedom of God's grace. We are free in God's grace. We are free to follow, pursue Christ with everything that's in us, with no fear of the of the flesh and the and the world and the devil getting getting enslaving us again. The only danger is there where we believe the lie. That's the only danger to us. We need to grow. I need to grow. I need to mature. Even at my ripe old age of 39. <laughs> I need to grow. I need to mature. So here's our marching orders from God in Romans 12, from the Message Translation, speaking to believers. So here's what I want you to do, God helping you. Take your everyday, ordinary life, your sleeping, eating, going to work and walking around life and place it before God as an offering. Mm -hmm. Embracing what God does for you is the best thing you can do for Him. Don't become so well adjusted to your culture that you fit into it without even thinking. Instead, fix your attention on God You'll be changed from the inside out. Amen. Mm -hmm. Readily recognize what He wants from you and quickly respond to it. Unlike the culture around you, always dragging you down to its level of immaturity. Boy, isn't that the truth? Yes. The culture around you will drag you down to its level of immaturity. Unlike that, God brings the best out of you and develops well-formed maturity in you. I have I've been over this message many times. And every time I read it, God says, are you listening, Tom? <laughs> Are you hearing me, Tom? I don't know what impression this makes on you this morning, but I want to capsule. First of all, we're encouraged to go about our daily lives preaching the gospel with our life. Not necessarily with our words, but with our life. 
preaching the gospel. And if necessary, we use words. But our everyday life should reflect the love and the compassion and the power of Jesus Christ. Amen. I have uh, probably told some of you this, you've heard me say this before, but when I, go, when I leave the house to go to Publix for milk and bread and eggs, I leave the house as much as whenever I can remember it, I never forget sometimes. I leave the house saying, I am going to Publix to witness about the love and compassion and power of Christ. That's what I'm going there for. And while I'm there, I'll pick up some milk and bread and eggs. That should be, our, that should be our, our, our mantra every day. When we leave the house, I'm going to work. Well, I'm, not, I'm going to, that, to my place of business in order to represent Jesus Christ to everybody I meet. And while I'm there, I'll do my job and get my paycheck. That should be our, that should be our, the way we leave every day. And I try to remember that every day. I don't remember it every time. Because I know I'm probably a lot like some of you. I get caught up in my mission. Right? Like, this is what I got to do, you know? I'll get it done, but I got to be aware of those around me. I was going through the checkout line at Publix. I know at Winn-Dixie the other day. And the, the, the gal behind that, she was a, a black gal behind the counter. And she, she, was, she was teary out. Her tears were coming down her cheeks. She was wiping them away. And I, I just said, you're having a rough day. She said, oh, yes. She said, I'm, I'm so sorry. I'm crying here in, in front of everybody. I'm so, so sorry. I said, well, let's pray. So I reached over, grabbed her hand, and just asked God to comfort her and strengthen her. Amen. And you know, that's, that's, just, that's nothing about me. It's about, this is, what, this is an example of what we need to do. Be aware. Amen. Be aware of people around you. They're hurting. They're, they're in need. And, and, and just take that moment to reach out. I, I think that was like, like a 10 second prayer. But reach out to people. Touch them. Care about them. If you, you, they'll know if you care. Just do it. I'm, I'm so bad at it usually. Because I'm, I'm a guy with, I've got blinders on, man. I just get, I've got some place to go, something to do. God is, God is gradually opening up my field of vision. I pray he'll do that for you. Secondly, we're encouraged to make disciples. If you run across a new believer, some, a young believer, spend time with them. Help them. Help them to understand the things of God. Encourage them to move ahead closer to the Lord. Another thing, we're encouraged to become true disciples by, by obeying, following everything taught by Jesus in his word. And we know that our old self is nailed to the cross, but it will still try to control us. It will still try to get our attention, turn us away from God's path. But in Christ we are free from its power. It's a faith thing. I hear it. I hear that voice. I'm not going to leave. And that thing cannot control me anymore. I don't know about you, but... There are, there are what they call besetting sins, stuff we do over and over and over and over again because we're believing a lie. And I got them too. But we're free from this power and we can trust God to transform us into the image of Christ. James 4.10 says, Humble yourself before the Lord and He will lift you up in honor. Amen? Mm -hmm. I want you to Consider what you heard this morning as, as his voice, not mine. And if I've been in error in any part of this, I pray he'll reveal that to you as well. But the fundamental message is clear. The fundamental message is clear. 
I have been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live, but Christ lives within me. Who, who here this morning has, will admit to having a real struggle with something in your life? Would you just, would you, would, if that's you, would you just sort of stand where you are? Let's just believe God. I just want you to stand. You're really struggling with something in your life. It could be health, finances, attitude, um, addiction, addiction. want to get past this. If it's a health thing, believe for healing, and while you, if, if you're not healed right away, just believe God. He's got you in His hand. He's got hope. If it's financial, God said, I'll supply all your need. If it's an addiction, He said, I'll set you free. If it's a relationship, He said, I can restore it. I can make it well. It's some sort of sinful behavior that nobody knows about but you. God said, I'll, I'll, I'll wash you. I'll wash you clean. No, you say, I have washed you clean. You just have to realize it. And accept it. Receive it. Father, you see us all. I'm standing here as well. Lord, you see us all. You see things about us that nobody else does. You care about us more than anybody else does in this whole world. You love us so much that you gave yourself for us. So that we might become everything you want us to be. Lord, that we stand here in your presence admitting that we need help. We simply trust you for that help. Whatever it may be, we confess our need. We lay it down before you. And we turn around and we walk away from it. From our fear, from our doubt, from our sin everything that's holding us back to becoming true disciples. We leave it there. Lord, we're going to walk out of this building today with a fresh, new, deeper understanding of who we are in Christ and what we can accomplish no matter where we go from here. We give you all the honor Praise and the glory for your word, for your love, for your patience. Oh God, thank you for your patience with us. You're so patient that we know you love us. There's no one, if there's someone here who has never received Christ as Savior, today's the day for you. Simply reach out and say, Lord, I believe. I need, I need to let go of myself and receive you as Savior. It's between you and God. No special ceremony. Just a sudden realization that you can't do it on your own. You need Him. Father, we give you praise for your goodness. Thank you for speaking to our hearts today in Jesus' name.